This is Mohobe Nuggets of Wisdom Podcast. We enthuse, we energize, we inspire, and we empower entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs of all stripes in BW and beyond. Hello, dear viewer and listener. Welcome once again to another episode of Mohobe Nuggets of Wisdom Podcast. As always, we're excited, in fact, super excited to have you take time out of your very busy schedule so that you can interact with us on this podcast. But as always, let me ask you to do me the small favor of striking that notification bell as well as that subscribe button. We need it, guys. We need you uh, to be part of this, uh, this story. And the only way we can stay relevant and grow this podcast is through your participation through just striking those bells please be part of it a lot of viewers we've discovered two-thirds can you believe it don't subscribe and yet they watch please do subscribe i beg of you welcome to the studio uh Thank you. miriam tandi umbongogo is it go -go? <laughs> my, yeah, my name is difficult to pronounce you know in Sitwana, hmm. it would be umbohoho Oh, in okay. Sitana, Bohoho. Mm. Now in, in Kenyan is Ombogo. 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 Huh? Ombogo. Yes. Yeah, mm. okay. All right. Mm. Welcome to the studio and thank you for joining us here at Mohobe Nuggets of Wisdom Podcast. Thank you. We're so excited to have you. So am I. I'm yeah. excited to be here. Yeah. Mm. Tell me a little bit about your background, share mm. uh, what you do, and introduce yourself to the people. My name is Tandi Ombogo. I liked my first name officially is Miriam, but I like to use Tandy, my middle my middle name. Mm -hmm. I am an acquisitions librarian with the Library of Congress, the U.S. Library of Congress. It's based in the U.S., America, Washington D.C. I am based in Nairobi. Nairobi is one of six offices that Library of Congress has, and our work is to acquire materials, not only for the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., but other university libraries in the U.S., like Stanford, Yale, UCLA, Harvard. We acquire books for them as we acquire for the Library of Congress. So that basically, yeah, that's my background. Mm -hmm. So you're a librarian by training? I am an acquisitions librarian. Mm -hmm. So I am a, a, a trained librarian. Okay. So my first what does degree... does that entail? Librarian, basically, the work that I do is... We say librarianship has to do with acquiring materials, mm -hmm. repackaging it in a way that you can make it available to the users and then disseminating the information. Mm -hmm. So it basically means you gather all the information you can put it together in a way that is easy to to read, easy to access by a user, mm -hmm. and then make it available to the users. Oh, okay. As an acquisitions librarian, that's a subset, a subset of librarianship, which basically means that I go out to look for library materials mm -hmm. and bring them back to the library to be processed so that they can be made accessible to anyone who would like to use mm -hmm. that for research, or it doesn't have to be research, it can be reading just regular reading mm -hmm. yeah and to become a librarian what sort of training does it uh, what sort of degree does it involve the first degree like in my case my first degree was a bachelor of information sciences that basically trains you how to handle a book mm -hmm. how do you recognize who the writer of the book is it's very important to know who wrote the book when the book was written who published the book and how many pages does it have so you basically get training on how to access the books how to process them how to make them available one of the things that is very important for librarianship is copyright we do not want people to go pro uh, copying other people's work mm -hmm. as a librarian you're taught to respect that so that we can like now in this case, the book that you have, we are taught how to respect that. She's referring to this book. Mm. Yeah. Nuggets of Grit. Yeah. We are taught, when you pu you put so much to put, to put that book together, well, we don't want someone... Two and yeah. a half to three years uh, exactly. working on it. We do not want someone else to come and lay claim to it. Mm. So it's very important for us to to have the copyright, to respect that, to protect it. Do you verify it. the copyright at SIPA, for instance? That's verified by the National Library. Mm -hmm. In this case, it's Botswana National Library Services. Mm -hmm. In Kenya, we have an equivalent, Kenya National Library Services. Mm -hmm. So their, their work is to do that. As librarians, we just make sure that that is done well. 
Okay. Yeah. The Library of Congress, is it part of the Senate and the actual um, House of Representatives of the United States? It is. The Library of Congress was first put together as a, a research library for the American Congress. Mm -hmm. That's the reason the Library of Congress came up. Over the years, it became a national library to the American people. So the, the mission of the library of U.S. Library of Congress is to be a research library for the U.S. Congress primarily, and secondly, it is a national library for the American people. Mm -hmm. That means that all Americans and anyone in America really can come to the Library of Congress to access it and get the information that they're looking for. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes it very important. In the in the old times, they, they from my reading, they used mm -hmm. to have a large university um, library in Alexandria, in, okay. uh, in Egypt. In Egypt, uh, mm -hmm. when Egypt was still at the center of civilization, mm -hmm. would you say the Library of Congress is like that? Is it the largest concentration of books and information in the world? It is. Currently, the Library of Congress has the largest concentration. We have over 150 million pieces mm -hmm. and still growing mm -hmm. because the mission of the Library of Congress is to acquire materials from all over the world. Mm -hmm. The goal is that if you go to Library of Congress as a user, no matter what you're looking for in whatever language, whatever subject, whatever format, you ought to be able to find it at the Library of Congress. Mm -hmm. And that is why one of the things Library of Congress does is to acquire books directly from the Western world that they have direct access to, and they have field offices in six different parts of the world, like Nairobi being one of them, to acquire yeah. from a region. Mm -hmm. In this case, Nairobi acquires from Sub-Saharan Africa. Mm -hmm. Is there another one for the rest of Africa, like Sahara? There the Sahara? is. We have one in Cairo. That one does North Africa and the Middle East. Mm -hmm. We have another one in New Delhi to cover the Asian world. We have Jakarta. We have another one in uh, South South America, Latin mm -hmm. America, okay. in Rio. All right. Yeah. Um, as a librarian, um, you took direct interest personally in my mm -hmm. book, correct? I did. Um, can you tell us about that and share with the viewers? Because um, I don't know why but it would really benefit one yeah. someone yeah. to know the process and then give a specific example with my book mm -hmm. one of the the process that i do when i land in a country like botswana one of the first things i'll do is find out where these books are accessible in Botswana is the Botswana National Library Services because that's a central depository. That basically means that anyone who produces a book must give a copy or two of their books to Botswana National Library Services mm -hmm. in Botswana. Mm -hmm. For me, that is beneficial because when I go to Botswana Library Services, I ask them to tell me in the last year, because I come here once a year. So in the last year since I was here, what new books have been produced? They usually will give me a list and the contact details of new books which are there. Mm. And there are multiple books. So what now I do, over the years I've told them what I look for, which basically is a book that can be used for research, a book that is not, ins it's not inspirational, it is not self-development, it is not a children's book because our readership are adults. Mm -hmm. So we do not do children's books. What and do you have against personal development? We don't have anything against it. It's just that because our readers are researchers, mm. they need books that they can do research on. Oh, okay. The ones on personal development, generally, you, you can't really do much research of that because that's everyone's experience. Mm -hmm. And that's why we now narrow it down. There's nothing wrong with self-development books. It just does not suit our readership. Mm -hmm. So that's basically it. Yeah. Nothing okay. wrong with what we don't acquire. But it's just it does not suit our readership because our readers are researchers. Mm -hmm. We do buy novels, the reason being that novels generally portray the culture of a country. We buy movies and music done locally for the same reason. They portray the culture of the, of the place. Mm -hmm. Now, when I go to Botswana National Library, so that's what I do. The reason your book caught my attention is because I like the storyline it comes from the, you know, the way the subtitle says from the cattle post to serial entrepreneurship. Mm. I thought that's, that's a long way. Now for someone to have got from this point to this point, mm. I thought that was very important because mm. one of the things we lose is we don't realize that 
the lives that we lead can impact someone else. So if someone can read your story and see where you came from and where you are now, mm. then they will know that so long as they keep going, so long as they do not give up, this is going to be beneficial. No. Also, because my readership is mostly the American people, I thought it was a good thing for the Americans to know that we do have success stories in Africa, made in Africa, for Africa, by Africa. Mm -hmm. I thought your story was a good example of that. Mm -hmm. Now, that caught my attention. That's wow. why I decided to buy it. Mm -hmm. One of the things we do is, when we look at a book, first I'll decide, do, does it fit our acquisition policy, first and foremost? That's for the Library of Congress. Beyond that, is this book good enough for me to give it to our participating libraries? Mm -hmm. That's why now I buy multiple copies. Like in your case, I bought 13 copies. That's because That's looking at it... just the first order. <laughs> <laughs> I there, like that. There could be more. <laughs> there could be more. That is true. There could be more. Mm. So looking at it, I thought that the university libraries that we supply to would benefit from mm. reading it and, mm. and knowing also what life and business is like mm. in the African continent. Yeah, it's funny you should say that. I'll, I'll tell you that mm. when I wrote the book, I, I had read a... a book by a guy in the same space I am. Yeah. I think his name is Don Peebles, okay. uh, who is an African-American uh, mm -hmm. property developer. Okay. So he was one of my inspiration. I read his book in mm -hmm. 2012. Mm -hmm. It was, inspired me. And from 2012 to now, our asset base more or less quadrupled oh, yeah. after I read that book. Mm -hmm. So it is only fair that maybe I could do the same mm -hmm. and in the process inspire someone. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And that's what I also had in mind when I bought the book. I mm. thought someone else reading this will get inspired. Yes. Yeah. I appreciate the purchase, mm. madam. I appreciate mm. the, the, the purchase. And, and, and there's always been a belief, uh, whether it's wrong or not, that Americans tend to be a little dumb when it comes to things like history, things like culture. Um, I wonder whether some what your impression is about that and whether some of your work does help in addressing that perception, whether it's correct or not. I, I can't comment on whether it's correct or not, but what I do know is that they go out of their way to the ones who are in the academic realms, which we, and those are who my users are. Those are the people I can talk about. Yeah. Because my users are those in academic and research institutions. Mm. Those ones will go out of their way to find out what's going on beyond their borders. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason we have a whole office acquiring books from the African mm -hmm. continent and all over the world, really. So those are the ones I can talk about because mm -hmm. I know they're interested in books. They're interested in f knowing what is going on uh, outside of that. Yeah. The ones outside of the academic and research space, I don't really interact with yeah, them very yeah, much. Yeah. yeah. So I can't comment and on could, that. It could, in fact, just be a perception. But sometimes it could also be a perception. When somebody you, you meet someone in this mm. in America and they like you and they say. Oh, by the way, have you met my friend so and so in Nigeria? Oh yeah. It's implying that it's in the same neighborhood. Oh yeah. You know, so mm. more sometimes they don't seem to have an idea of the basic mm. topography and mm -hmm. geography of the place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, now, I want to talk about readership. Okay. First, explain why it is important to develop a culture of readership, mm. which is something we're struggling with. Even established business persons, you try to sell them a book, they say, I don't read. Mm. I would rather, you know, exercise and then maybe listen to an audio book. Mm -hmm. I want you to talk, speak to readership in particular. Why is it important? Maybe giving examples in your own life, how it has impacted you and how it could possibly impact the reader who was watching. What you're saying is very true because I have found that in life we can't live to do everything, be everything, see everywhere. One of the ways you can get away is through reading. You can find your way into the world through reading. You get a lot of exposure when you read. When you read other people's perceptions, other people's work, other people's research, it, it enables you to dig into a world outside of your own. Mm. And that then exposes you as a reader to what is available outside of your square. So I think that reading is very important. One of the things I have l uh, come to see is that for most of us, I don't know if it's Kenya or just the sub-Saharan African continent, but we read mostly for school. When we are out of school, we don't do too much reading. I would 
implore on the viewers to build a culture of reading because that is how you get to know what's going on outside of your normal world it also makes you know that what things which are possible it gives you ideas into where the world is going it gives you especially if you're being an entrepreneur then you know also how to challenge yourself how to push yourself so that you know that really there are no limits you can mm. go however wide mm. it's very in my opinion it's very important to read and to do research I know we want quick fixes like the movies but if you read a book and then watch the a movie that has been made based on that book mm. a lot has been cut out mm. so you don't get the full story when the you movie watch, is yeah. 90 minutes the movie is 90 minutes mm. and it wants to condense everything in the book into 90 minutes which mm. is not practical mm. and also because of the kind of budget that they have mm. when you read the book you get the full story you get the details mm. and you get to know a whole lot more and to gain, in my opinion, a whole lot more than you would mm. if you just watched the movie. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. This is great. Can mm -hmm. you relate that now to your personal story and tell me how readership may have impacted the trajectory of your life? I want you to personalize <laughs> it a bit. I would say that for sure because as a child growing up, I grew up, part of my life I grew up in Swaziland that's where my parents are when i was growing up and one of the things we were taught to do is to read a lot mm. and my, my mother encouraged us to read and reading a lot made me realize that there was a lot outside of my world which was in swaziland and in kenya as well and i was able to grow up and know that i can push myself to be a whole lot better as an adult i've also come to learn that especially my work is to buy books buying books i come to interact with people who do so many different things in life they come from different cultures different entrepreneurial backgrounds different professions and for me personally reading about a lot of these people has made me realize that there's no limit you can push yourself basically to be what you need to be mm -hmm. i like that and I, which is i also gave that example of a movie versus a book because there are some books I read and I really like them and I think, oh, I would like to see this book in action. Mm. I watch the movie and it's a little bit disappointing mm. because the, the grit of the, of the journey mm. is lost a lot of the time. So mm. for me, I also have come to learn that reading ex exposes me to a different world mm. that I would like to aspire myself into. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in terms of you then... Is there a particular book or a particular series of books that catapulted you forward? I've read so many books yeah. in, 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 uh, in my life. I wouldn't say that there is a series of books really that mm. have brought me forward. But one of the things, it's very interesting that mm. for my work, I do not buy self-development books mm. because my readership is out of that. Mm. But personally, I do buy self-development mm. books mm -hmm. because I have learned that I've become a better person by reading some of these self-development books, mm -hmm. knowing how to conduct myself in different environments mm -hmm. because I interact with the world a lot with different cultures and knowing and understanding that cultures are different mm -hmm. and how I deal with people in Botswana, how I deal with people in Kenya is completely different. I learned that through reading. Yeah. So I actually do like to look for self-development books. Mm -hmm. I like to read about books that have, like yours, mm -hmm. that's talking about Nuggets of Grit and how you moved from this step to that step. Mm -hmm. I really like to see that storyline and how people yeah. develop mm -hmm. because it encourages me that if I just keep going, if I just hold on, I will get to the other side. Yeah, yeah. So those are the kind of books for personally that have catapulted me mm -hmm. into a better person. Yeah. And, and just understanding where people come from. I like books like that. So yeah. I always laugh about it that I don't buy self-development -deve books for work, mm -hmm. but I buy them for myself. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's also interesting mm -hmm. you should say that because some mm -hmm. of the books that are sort of autobiographical absolutely have mm -hmm. that element of personal development in them. Yeah. My book in particular yeah. may not be uh, in the personal development section, uh, it will be in the memoirs or personal development section, but it covers 
some element of personal development. It does. Yeah. It yeah, does. Yeah. So I like to read about, especially when it comes to autobiographies. I like that because, you know, a lot of times we see where people are. We don't realize what it has taken for them to get there. Where they've been, what they've where been they've through. Where they've been, what they've been through. We think it's just easy because they're doing it. But when I see what someone has gone through to get to where they are, it encourages me mm. to also encourage other people. Especially mm. when I see others going through a hard time, I tell them, you know, you can do it. Just keep uh, keep going. Keep at it. <laughs> now, do you see uh, internationally readership patterns advancing or declining? What is the state of readership across the world? I think when it comes to educational matters, that still people read because they have to pass exams. Mm. When it comes to readership outside of education, sometimes I think it's the culture of wherever, like now let's say Nairobi, Kenya specifically, when it comes to that, the culture of reading is not too much. We are trying to encourage our young children now to gain a culture of reading so they grow up to be people who read. Mm -hmm. I think somewhere, I think it's, in, in my opinion, it goes culturally. There's one culture that reads a lot, another culture, another generation, sorry. There's mm -hmm. one generation that reads a lot, another generation comes that does not read too much. Mm -hmm. And sometimes for us on the African continent, I think it has to do with all the things that we are also handling. Mm -hmm. We don't make the time to read. Mm -hmm. So readership is something that m is changes from one generation to the next. Next. Mm. It's also different from one culture to the next. It also depends on the availability of books, especially affordable books mm. that children or adults can read. Mm. But generally, seeing how many people are publishing books, I think generally readership is growing. It's growing. Yeah. Generally, I think it is growing. Yeah. Mm. Um, there are particular cultures that you see uh, uh, who, who are associated with the readership. For instance, Jewish culture. Oh, yeah. They are called the people of the book. Mm -hmm. And uh, readership is part of the culture. Yeah. Do you think there's something we can learn from them in terms of how, as a culture, they've succeeded monetarily mm -hmm. for most financially successful group in the world, how they've succeeded in terms of, uh, you know, winning Nobel Peace Laureates and other prizes, not peace, the other one, for for literature and for oh, okay. physics and all these things. They mm -hmm. won the most yes. more than anybody else. Do you have any comment on that? Absolutely. I want to believe that their culture of reading has catapulted them into what they are and the successes that they have because they have information outside of their own environment. Mm. And I believe one of the things that to, if you want to grow, you really need to, le to read. Read different subjects, different topics, uh, read different genre. Of, Even outside yeah. your area of specialization. Absolutely. You have to read outside your area of specialization because one of the things in the world, we see people are not uh, isolated. People are not islands. Mm -hmm. You know, we are all interlinked one way or another. So when we read outside of our area of specialization, we get to know and to interact with a different part mm -hmm. of the environment. And I think that the example you've given for the Jewish people, mm. it's, I want to believe that their culture of reading and intentionality with reading has enabled them to be where they are. So yeah. even as Africans, if I can say that, if we get to read more, we will be able to do more mm. and we'll be able to be more. Mm. So I absolutely would encourage the listeners to take up a culture of reading and not just read for school, read outside of mm. that as well. Yeah. And do you think that uh, readership has something to do with successful entrepreneurship. In other words, is there a connection between succeeding as an entrepreneur and reading? I'll tell you why I ask mm -hmm. and then uh, maybe give you a little hint at an answer. Okay. Um, we know that somebody like uh, Warren Buffett says he spends six to eight hours a day mm -hmm. reading. Mm -hmm. uh, it's well, it's well, we know that somebody like uh, Steve, uh, not Steve, Steve Jobs was a big reader, but not I was thinking reader, more of no. Bill Gates, okay. who takes uh, readership uh, vacations, mm -hmm. just vacations to go and read. Mm -hmm. um, with that having been said, any connection that you can make from your own experience between readership and a successful entrepreneurship? I believe so, because when, when people read more, they get to know more, they get to be exposed more to aspects outside of their world. And just the way you have given these examples, these are people who've read a lot, but they've also done a lot. Mm. 
and I believe that our awareness, our involvement, our capability is challenged and pushed when we read a lot. Mm -hmm. So I want to believe that entrepreneurship and reading will go hand in hand and you become better because it also exposes you to different ways of doing the same thing Mm -hmm. and being able to come up with new ideas, come up with better ideas Mm -hmm. that's birthed from reading. Being able to show people a new thing that you know sometimes ex- success comes from coming up with ideas that people didn't already think about. Mm. They do something, but you show them a different way to do that. Mm. Those are the kind of ideas that you get when you read. Mm. So I believe that reading is very much connected to entrepreneurship, mm. and that success comes out of reading more. Okay. Yeah. And I think I don't think it's by coincidence that mm. the the people you've named are also big readers. I don't think that's yeah, a coincidence. No. I think it's it's related. Yes, it's a, it's not an accident. Mm-hmm. All right, we we talked about um, your work. Are there any particular setbacks or shall I say challenges that you are willing to share of in your life uh, that that will benefit someone who's who's listening to this interview? On a personal level, one of my biggest challenges when I finished my first degree was getting a job that was suitable to what I had trained for, which was information science. Mm -hmm. At that point, information science was a very new aspect and and there was not too many information specialists Mm. who had that recognition. Mm. And therefore, for me, getting into the job market was very difficult. And I had to, first of all, do work that was not related to my training, Mm -hmm. just so that I could get along. What did you have to do? One of the things I did was to teach computers, which Mm. I basically just caught uh, along. Mm. I I did research for companies. I worked in a bank. I was not a banker, but I learned on the job. And after doing all that, I eventually found my job now at the Library of Congress, and mm-hmm. that's directly related to my training. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that for me kept me going is I just had to look forward and keep going and keep trying. It didn't matter how many... Uh, how many years it took you in the wilderness, so to speak, so if, to speak before to come getting to the promised land. Absolutely. I had to just keep going. It took so you th- that a was decade a decade or two? It took me about five years oh, okay yeah no, that's not too bad now it doesn't look too bad but when i started mm. where you come out of school and two weeks later you have a job in your training it mm. was a big deal mm. yeah it was a big deal back then that was in the mid 90s then yeah. it was a big deal yeah, yeah yeah now not so much okay yeah why the library of congress in other words how mm. did you drift towards them was it one of those uh, serendipities or, or it's something that you orchestrated and planned it's a mixture of both because mm-hmm. doing information sciences as a subject in school, we learned about the Library of Congress. That is where the classification scheme, the cataloging scheme, the birth of librarianship as we know it has its roots in the Library of Congress. Therefore, when I left my, my school, I knew Library of Congress was something I would want to work with and I gravitated towards that. Mm. But when the position came up, also that was serendipitous, for sure. Oh, oh. So it was a, a mixture of both. But mm. knowing what it was by the time I was sitting down for the interview, I gave it my best shot because mm. I knew what I was interviewing for. It's like you spent your life preparing for preparing that interview. Preparing for that interview. Yeah. And therefore, and when you aced it, it. Oh, yes. When it came along, yeah. I aced it. And here I am, 20 mm. something years later, mm. I'm still at it. And okay. it's something that I'm very thankful for. Mm-hmm. It's something that, because. I'm a believer, and so I also believe my path is not just yeah. by chance. So, but are you yeah. doing it? Are you are you at a PhD level there in librarianship, or I is something in the works? Something in the works because I've my first degree, of course, is information science. Then, mm. believe it or not, my second degree was uh, an masters in business administration Mm -hmm. because i felt it would be beneficial for me to what i was talking about go out of your subject area learn something new Mm. so i went to do business administration to learn management and administration Mm. then i i did a second master's degree in library studies so Mm. that i can now hone in Mm -hmm. and become better 
Okay. The PhD, that one is on the works. Mm. I've not started it yet, but it's in my back burner. Okay. Yeah. So really, this this the only setback was it took you five years to find it your dream job. It took me five years to, to get my dream job. Now, when you talk about challenges, I was talking, I was thinking about challenges in the job. Yeah. Like you know, I I travel a lot to sub-Saharan countries to buy books. Mm-hmm. Landing in a country that I'm not familiar with, dealing with a currency I'm not familiar with, dealing with people that I'm not familiar with, that's always challenging. Mm. And what works in Nairobi does not work in Botswana, for mm. example. So I had to learn very quickly. In, when I was in Botswana, that people greet each other, and I had to learn Dumela, Dumela very yeah. fast. Yeah, <laughs> and I also learned that saying Dumela is a, a way of opening, breaking the eyes mm. and opening doors. Yeah, so that's something I do with every place that I land. Mm. So it's always a challenge learning the culture and knowing how best to become productive. Because I only have a week, mm. so within a week, I'm supposed to know how these people mm. are, what makes meet them the right tick, people, meet the right meet people, the be in the right place. Mm such that by the time I'm going back to my office, I have done what I was sent out to do. Mm, mm. So that's always challenging. Okay. Yeah. But any particular <laughs> particular hair-raising stories, experiences in Africa? I have a lot of hair-raising stories. Let me see. One that I can share. Mm. Uh, he, you know, I was once... One of the things, again, you learn as you go to different cultures. I remember once, Swaziland, interesting thing, I had gone to the parliament. I didn't realize that it was an offense to wear trousers uh-huh. as a woman mm. in the parliament. Mm. So when I in went Swaziland. in Swaziland, mm. so when I went, I came out of the car. The, my driver told me I was looking for the constitution. Mm. So my driver told me, "Oh, that's the man to talk to." He didn't say who that was. Mm. So I came out of the car running because I wanted to get him before he gets into the building. Mm. I introduced myself. I say where I'm from and what I'm looking for, and he says, "Sure, follow me." So I follow him. As I'm sitting down in his office, he tells me, give me a few minutes. I need one phone call, then I'll be with you. So as he's making his phone call, I'm looking around his office, and I realize that I'm sitting with the Minister for Justice. Mm. And I, in that moment, I'm thinking to myself, OK, what do I do? Mm. Was I inappropriate? Mm. You know? And shortly after that, when I was walking out, because when I walked in with him, I was okay because I'm with the Minister of Justice. No mm. one is going to challenge me. Yeah. But when I left him, I'm now on, I'm on my own. That's where I got the challenge. Mm. And it took, I know they're not saying what the problem is. So it took someone else to interpret and tell me you're not dressed appropriately for being in parliament. How will we be building. treating you in the meantime? I f- it, it felt like I was a bomb about to explode. <laughs> 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 because they all kept there around me. You know, they're talking it to society. I can't exactly understand what they're saying. Uh. And they're making gestures. And they're telling me, don't move, don't go anywhere. And I'm, in fact, I've asked them, is there something that is wrong? <laughs> but they're not saying. It, was, it felt like, I think for them, it was a taboo to come anywhere near me. But mm. they're also not saying what the problem is. Mm. So one person who realized I was really not understanding what they're saying told me, Madam, you're wearing trousers in parliament. Mm. That's not allowed. Mm. And I remember thinking, that doesn't, in where I come from in Kenya, that does not look like a big thing. Mm. But in Swaziland, that was a big thing. Mm. And it almost denied me access going back in to see the, the, the minister for justice. I could not go back on my own. He, he didn't notice when he went to make that phone call that you had not properly dressed. I think for him, he looked at the bigger picture, which was, I'm looking for the con- constitution, he has access to it. Mm. I don't think for him it was a big deal. He didn't deal. apply his mind there. Yeah. yeah, he didn't apply his mind there. But for the mm. people around him, it was a big deal. Wow. Yeah. That's very, very interesting. <laughs> so yeah. I find a lot of interesting stories as mm. I go along. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And now let's talk about um, triumphs and successes what did you say um, would be the the big the the biggest ones one from in my line of work Mm. going back to my office having done what i was sent out to do is always a triumph and Mm. always a success Mm. because it's very unpredictable you don't know what you're going to find when you go on the ground and when I'm sent out to buy books and I come back with a load full of books, it's mm. a triumph. Mm. When I get one of the things I remember, I was looking for the Seychelles law reports and the laws of Seychelles, but I'm based in Nairobi. Mm. These books are available in Seychelles. Mm. And I remember calling the Attorney General's office and calling the Ministry for Justice's office, asking for these books. And they tell me, oh, yes, we do have the books. Just come and get them. 
and I tell them, I'm in Nairobi, I can't come and get them. Mm. Can you give me an account number to send the money to? And I'll send a DHL van to come and pick the books from there. Mm. They said, no, you have to come. Why? And I tried to explain to them that it's not practical for me to come. It took, it took me about a year back and forth talking to them and trying to convince them to have this conversation mm. become fruitful. But they were not budging. They said, you just come, pay your money, and we'll give you the books you want. Mm. Eventually, I had to think of a friendly contact within mm. Seashells. Mm. We have a bookshop that we, are, we buy our newspapers from. Mm -hmm. Since we have that relationship, I called the manager, explained to her what my challenge was, mm. and asked her if I could send money to her as the Library of Congress, can she send someone to the library, to the Ministry for Justice and the Attorney General's office mm -hmm. to buy these books on our behalf? And she said, sure. Mm. And that's how we ended up acquiring those materials. So for me, that was a big triumph yeah, because yeah. I was able to get this for the Library of Congress and it was something that the law library was very interested in. Mm. So that was a big triumph for me wow. that I was able to acquire these books without physically presenting myself yeah, there. because it would have taken a long time exactly. for you to yeah. do that. Mm, yeah. no, that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. And um, now, uh, I always ask this question to the youngsters. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you're going to answer. I, I'm always urged to ask this question by the youngsters, I meant to say. Yeah. Where is the money? You know, you are an entrepreneurship show mm -hmm. and you are talking to people who supposedly make him money. Ask them, some of them, don't let them go without telling us, mm. where is the money? How do we make money in this particular field? And are there good prospects for successfully making money, be, for financial success, put it that way? That's a very interesting question. In my <laughs> line of work, in my line of work, I think we never really think about where is the money. We think more about how can we get the inf the information that we need yeah. to get the money that we want. Mm. And therefore, I would say just read mm. <laughs> and read some more mm. and and put down books and not only inspirational books. It it would take someone to go and do research. I don't think you can get a lot of money out of, this is my opinion, out of writing books unless you end up writing, although when I say that, yeah. you have to write, you have to literally put yourself at your desk and write several books. Books, yeah. And because I do know some successful authors who make their living out of the books mm. that they sell. Mm when I think about it. We yeah. do have them in, even in Nairobi. My sister is an author actually. Ooh, how and many she, has she written? She's written four books so far mm. and I know that she gets a decent living out of that. That's not the only thing she does mm. but it's a good way to also bump up to bump, up, to right. bump her so up. I so I would, I, would, I would tell the readers get down and read. Do your research, mm. read, write, find out what the users around you are interested in mm. so that you write the kind of books that will do, will get people's attention and mm. will sell. Yeah. And eventually, if you if you do it right, if you get the right information, surround yourself with people who have already done it, like <laughs> yeah. so that you can walk them through it and yes. know how to re how to write the books together mm. i believe they will become uh, they will make money through that yeah. and make a living out of it but they have to be able to be consistent and to want to work hard mm. and if they align themselves with or publish authors sorry like mm. yourself they can do it so yeah. there will be money there okay yeah is there a particular author that you admire who's done very well or that you've interacted with? I'm thinking here about the fact that, you know, the, um, there are certain authors, there's a, there are certain authors who are even billionaires. I think there's a woman, uh, the one who wrote the, you know, J.K. Rowling, uh -huh, that's her uh -huh. name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She wrote uh, the Harry Potter series. Yes. who's a billionaire. Mm -hmm. Are there some people in that, in that level that you've interacted with? or that you look up to? So there are people like, if I come to Kenya, we have uh, Ngugi Wathiongo. I haven't yes, interacted I with him personally, uh, but I've interacted with his work. Uh, and because he's, be, he's remained consistent over the years, he's someone who's well known. Mm. And he, uh, in addition to being a lecturer, he produces these books which have catapulted him into the world. Mm. And it's not his lecturing work, I guess, that has brought him up, but it's his work as an author mm. that has brought him up. So. That's someone who is, for me, I look and I say, you know, you can do this. 
Mm. I look at we we do have uh, other authors like mm. off the top of my head. I think I read I read so many books that sometimes when it comes to looking for one particular author it becomes a little bit of a challenge to mm. name them. But off the top of my head Google I think really stands up yeah, yeah. for me because I've interacted well, with a Chinua lot of Chinua Achebe there's uh, Yes, there's Chinua there. Achebe so, yeah. from our in neighbor. Africa, there are quite we a have Grace Ogot who was a Kenyan as mm. well mm. and she wrote a lot of books as we were growing up we read a lot of her books. Mm. She's been very instrumental in shaping the mm. minds of youngsters growing up yeah yeah so there's actually yeah this guy there's a lot of them i think that right now i just can't name them all yeah, but yeah. they're mostly kenyans yeah like Riso god chinu wachebe ngugi yeah. wathiongo those That's are impo- yeah those are important authors that yeah. i have interacted with mm-hmm. yeah. um do you think the explosion of social media has in encroached into reading and readership in any way shape or form absolutely absolutely because now social media gives people quick fixes mm. and their social media also t- has a way of giving people nuggets mm. so that in a, in a few pointers you have the whole story mm. when it comes to readership you have to go and read from book to book one of the things we're talking about when we were in school and in my undergrad we didn't have social media mm. we had to go and read a book cover to cover well, that's the story of my life too yeah, yeah so mm. that we can get information out of it mm. but now in social media you can literally get a synopsis mm. of a book a summary a summary of it so that you don't have to go and read the whole book mm. so social media has definitely eaten into AI the culture has of reading. also and there's ai also mm. now we have you can go and google just a section of the book that you're interested in mm. and read only that to find what you want mm. whereas before we had to browse through the full book reading through it to get mm. what it is that you want so social so media from, definitely so, has eaten so into are there pluses and minuses there advantages and disadvantages absolutely advantages are that people there's an information explosion now mm. Mm. people get a lot more faster because they have it on the internet they have it through social media so the exposure is is greater now mm. sometimes i think we are not necessarily deeper we don't mm. go deep into mm. what we need mm-hmm. because again you have everything at your t- fingertips so that is the drawback for me but the advantage is the exposure is high mm. so people are knowing more faster okay. better All which right. is a good thing mm. yeah so what does the crystal ball say for uh for tandy in terms of the future 10 uh, 20 30 years down the line from today what, yeah uh, for your brand and for what you do mm-hmm. uh, or what are you aspiring towards one of the things is i want to myself become i want to write books i've, I've bought books mm-hmm. i've read books I and I thought probably hmm, says it's about time. It's about time <laughs> and I thought it's about time but I also had my name as an author mm. on a book. I do ha- I do have short articles I've done academic short academic articles I've done which have been included in journals mm-hmm. but I thought I would want the to subject do of librarianship. The subject of librarianship. Mm-hmm. Most specifically book collection and the digital divide between digital natives people who are born into the digital world yes. and digital immigrants like myself people yeah. who found the internet as adults <laughs> and children I, are digital natives exactly yeah, yeah. yeah so i i wrote a book about i mean an article about the difference between how they access information mm-hmm. so i've written short articles but i would like to write books Mm-hmm. And I thought to myself I think it's about time I got myself into that world. Mm. So I want to just go deeper into the information world, not only produce books for myself but be able to make people more aware of what is available mm-hmm. and bring up a, a new generation that will be interested in sourcing for books. I assume you've started available. writing already. I have actually. Mm. <laughs> I have Mm. I have and before this year ends I think I should have my first one out. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow, that sounds very very exciting. Yeah. Um we can look forward to that, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And now that I put it out there, that gives me the determination to go and make it happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, mm-hmm. before we conclude our conversation, tell me about your impressions of Botswana. You've mm. been coming here for how long? About 20 years now. Okay, 20 mm. years you've been coming. 
Yes. What are your pre- impressions about the country and its people and its business people as well? Botswana people, I think one of the things I find is that Botswana people have, are people who love their country. I, th- I don't think in my interaction I found people who are passionate about their country the Botswana people are mm-hmm. and who they are and they own themselves, they own their their lot. Mm-hmm. Th- that's one thing I believe it or not, I find mostly in Botswana. Mm-hmm. And because the, the in my opinion, Botswana people also tend to stick together, which I think is a good thing. And sometimes I used to ask myself, why are we as Kenyans not this close-knit? But I think it's also in Kenya we have so many tribes. so we have, And the numbers are much and bigger. And the numbers are also much bigger, so mm. you can't really compare. Mm-hmm. But I find that about Botswana. So it's, it's very... I've come to learn that and come to learn how to integrate, which is why I'm saying one of the first things I had to learn is how to say Dumela. Mm. Because that opens doors. It does. It <laughs> yeah, does. I found out that just saying that simple word Dumela opens yeah, it, doors. It does. As opposed to Kenya, where whether you greet me in Swahili or English doesn't matter. Whether mm. you greet me or not doesn't matter. We need to do business. <laughs> yeah. But here I realize that it's an important thing to greet mm. people. Okay. So I find Botswana people very passionate about their world, about their country, about mm. their people, about their traditions. Mm-hmm. So that's it, it for me. That's it's a good thing because okay. we don't necessarily have that in Kenya. I guess because we are so mixed. Yes. That we don't really have like we don't have anything like a Kenyan food. Mm. Yeah, we don't. Oh, really, yeah. No, we have many many cultures. Many dishes, yeah, yeah, many dishes. Each, but each some which mm, are popular across. Some isn't are it? popular, but each each tribe have their own dish. So there's yes. no Kenyan dish. Mm. It's depending on which part of Kenya you're in. But one of the things I also came to learn here is, you know, they said so. You come in, you want a local food, you have said so. Mm, it's it's why, easy, yeah, 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 it's easy to just pick that up. Yeah. So being for me, that's a good thing. I always say, mm-hmm. Botswana can identify themselves. Okay. Yeah. That's great. That's great. Yeah, I keep coming, but but you say you only stay for one week. Why I is only that? stay for one why week. That? that one week is too short. <laughs> You appreciate the country. You mean over these 20 years, it's one week each time? One week each time. One okay. week each time. Because that's how, I think because we, we buy from so many countries mm. and because our budget also has to be realistic, mm. we only stay in a country for a week mm. and you move on to another one or go back to base so that we do more of, more of our work, we do it from our desks. Okay. So when we go out, you have literally a week, Sunday to Sunday to get the work done. Mm. Mm. Yeah just the way things are that's just the way things are and <laughs> sometimes we try to push there's so much work and you give us more time they say no you need to be, you need to manage yourself well and get your work done within the allocated period okay before you mm. ask me a question is there anything else you want to add or subtract from our conversation <laughs> as we as we wrap up not really i think i've said it all i think that what you're doing is a really good thing and i think that if you can just carry on with exposing your viewers to different arts, different subjects, different Mm -hmm. people. I think, and and I remember you saying, you know, acquisitions librarianship is not something that is known. Come Mm. and talk about it. Mm. So if you just carry on doing that, I think it will be a good thing. And your viewers coming up will know different aspects of life. Mm. So I think that's a good thing. Keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for saying that. Yeah. Um, What's your question for me? My question for you is what keeps you going? I love conversations. Okay. I love learning. I love interacting with people. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I love doing this because it's, it's, it's therapeutic. It's uh, information sharing. It's mm-hmm. educational. Mm-hmm. It's all of those things. And I, I could do this, you know, nonstop. Mm-hmm. So... To this uh, the last four and a half years, we set aside um, Thursdays yeah. when we speak to entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. Find myself looking forward to, to my Thursdays. Yeah. Not to say I don't enjoy my other work, because <laughs> one of the other things I do is that mm-hmm. I'm a speaker. I call myself an inspirational speaker, yeah. an experiential speaker as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I'm available to speak to audiences as mm-hmm. well. Mm-hmm. So I think it started when I was little. I talk mm-hmm. about it in the book. You, yeah. you, you you know I, I I was a bit of a yabba yabba. Maybe that's why I like law and 
and things mm-hmm. uh, evolve the way they did. But yeah. I enjoy talking to people like you. Yeah. Look at the honor and the privilege and the mm-hmm. joy of just sitting down and having a great conversation. Absolutely. Yes. Mm-hmm. Nothing beats that. Yeah, that is correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's correct. I, I always tend to be focused on the field of entrepreneurship, mm-hmm. but the entrepreneurship is very vast. Yeah. It covers mm-hmm. everything. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I hope I've answered your question. You have, yeah, you have, because yeah. I was going to ask the why, but when answering what keeps you going, you've answered the why as well. Yeah, so thank you. Yeah, thank so you. thank you very much. Yeah. yeah, it's very encouraging. Now look at mm. that camera mm-hmm. and talk to the viewer. Mm-hmm. Give them one final message as we wrap up. Keep reading. Keep reading. Expose yourself to things outside of your normal circle of association. Meet new people. Read more about what's going on around the world, not just in your world, because that's going to catapult you into, especially when you're talking about, you say you have young entrepreneurs, it will enable you to grow. Okay. Yeah. So I'd say keep going. Keep the great. <laughs> okay. Thank you. The great. Yeah. The great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hmm. That's what you liked about my book. That's what I liked about your book, The Great. Yeah. That caught my attention. Yeah. Yeah. People in Kenya will be watching this. Mm-hmm. Tell them why they should not only buy this book, mm-hmm. but subscribe to Morobe Nuggets of Wisdom podcast. <laughs> Kenyans, if you're watching this, I think you should, you should definitely subscribe to this podcast because there's a lot to learn, there's a lot to do, there's a lot to know outside of the Kenyan boundaries. I know Kenyans, Kenyans especially like to travel. Kenyans like to go out. Kenyans like Botswana, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I can say that because we have quite have a... Kenyan yeah, friends, yeah. We have a, a quite a chunk of Kenyans in Botswana. So Kenyans, watch this, find out what is going on. Get your ticket. And, uh, I know I'm selling Botswana. <laughs> Get your ticket. <laughs> and, 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 join and come more, and the enjoy. Podcast. Join yes, the podcast. Join the podcast. Because there you just subscribe. Just join the podcast because I think there's a lot of different subject areas that are being tackled. Mm. So that's definitely going to cause exposure, which is going to be good for you at the end of the day. And a big mm. shout out to my good friend, uh, Robert Burale. Robert, if you're oh, watching, absolutely. Hey, yeah. uh, man, I miss you. The last time <laughs> I saw you is six months ago. Mm-hmm. It's time. Remember, you're supposed to come to Botswana. Absolutely. If, if, you if better Robert make it be- happen. Yeah. Like, buy that ticket and make it happen. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much. You've been a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful guest. And you've done a terrific job. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate this. And I'm honored to have come and had this session. Thank you very much. Likewise. Yeah. Thank you so much.